Welcome everybody. This is Mark Jimenez, Wealth Advisor and Chief Investment Officer for CAM Investor Solutions. Today we have my good friend Sue Chesney joining us on uh, this next video session. Sue Chesney, she is the owner and principal of Delegated Planning, actually here in Denver as well. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. Nice to be here. And uh, I really think it's interesting to have you on today because your firm, you're, you have a, you're a registered investment advisor. Um, like Cam, but you're also catered to a little bit different audience of other independent advisors, not just here in Colorado, but around the country in terms of helping them do a lot of outsourced financial planning, advanced strategy, whether it's, you know, partial or in its entirety. And so you get to see a lot of different things and a lot of scenarios, which I think has been probably very valuable right now, especially while we're a lot of us are at home still. And you, like me, have had over 20 years in this industry not just helping individuals, but helping other advisors. So um, I think you and I, that's why we relate to a lot of things that we see in the industry. So today I thought I wanted to kind of dig into some of the planning topics because over the last four or five months, as we know, there's been, you know, with COVID, we're not health experts, we're trying to predict, but we have seen a lot of things in regards to planning and a lot of things that clients perhaps are asking advisors. And I think I wanted to get your take on some of the things, not just perhaps now, we can be thinking about but going forward so um with that being said you know one thing while the investment markets and the capital markets are going to do what they're going to do right it's hard to predict and they've been bumping not just now but over the last couple of years depending on which part of the market but i think it's important that our clients and a lot of investors out there still focus on the goals so maybe um if you can talk a little bit about some of these topics starting with this concept of tax planning you know it's a big topic and it's bound to change what do you anticipate the opportunities that investors should be thinking about when it comes to tax planning. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, investments are going to do what they're going to do. You can, you can only control as much as you can control. So, so when that feels out the window, uh, as it has been over the last few months with COVID, um, it, it's nice to sort of reframe your mind and be like, okay, what, what can I do right now to make a difference? Um, so tax planning being a, a great opportunity right now. We have the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was enacted back in 2018. And uh, basically it reduced the um, federal marginal tax rates. Uh, so they're historically low right now. Um, now that the TCJA, as we like to call it, it sunsets in 2026. So barring any legislative changes by Congress, uh, that will sunset and we will go back to the pre-2018 tax rates. So if you think about it right now, if you're in a 22% marginal tax bracket uh, and you make the same amount of money in 2026, you will now be in a 28% bracket. So, so there's an opportunity now between now and 2026 to sort of think about, okay, would it be worthwhile to pay more taxes now, do some tax planning strategies now, albeit at a lower rate, right? So um, you might want to declare more taxable income now and pay at the 22% bracket instead of waiting until after uh, 2026 where you might be hit with a 28% tax bracket. Mm -hmm. So some ideas, and especially this year, if, if you know, with the pandemic, a lot of people's incomes might be lower um, or perhaps you, you know, the advisors done a lot of tax loss harvesting, so they've got a, losses, a lot of losses they can put against income. Um, well, I guess up to $3,000, but, um, you know, doing Roth conversions right now. So that would move money from your tax deferred bracket into a tax free bracket. You pay taxes on the money that you actually convert based on this year's ordinary tax rate. But then once it's in the, in the Roth bucket, it grows tax free and distributions are tax free, um, after, after five years. So, so that's one opportunity I think that people can really take advantage of. So. So paying attention to what your current taxable income is now, where you expect it to be in the future. Um, if you think tax rates are going up, uh, even you know, barring the 2026 changes, um, you know, with the deficit we have right now, a lot of people think rates are gonna have to go up uh, in order to, to get back to, to normal times. So, so that's one thing. Um, Another opportunity now also due to the TCJA is the um, standard deduction increase. So, so now a married couple filing jointly has $24,000 uh, as a standard deduction. So 
so anyone that used to, that was charitably inclined and was able to itemize those deductions, you're not getting as much benefit for that gift. Um, and not everybody gives the gifts for the tax purposes, but it's nice to have as a bonus uh, if you are charitably inclined. So, so something you could do is bundling multiple years together into one uh, and taking it all at one time in one year and then taking the standard deduction on the off years. So for example, let's say you give $15,000 a year generally to your church. Um, $15,000 does not get you over that standard deduction. It might when you add in your mortgage interest and uh, state income taxes that you pay but you might just barely get over the 24,000, for example. But if you did two or three years and put it into a donor advised fund, so we'll call it three years, $45,000, you immediately get $45,000 in this year as a itemized deduction. And then the next two years, you still get the 24. So, and, and while some folks say, you know, I really like to give annually, I don't wanna give three years to my church all at once and then give nothing the next two years, what you can do is do a donor advised fund, you get the tax break in the one year, but then you can actually distribute the funds annually as you normally would do. Um, so, so the charity is still receiving the same frequency that you want them to receive it. Well, Sal, that's interesting because I think there are folks on the charitable side who are looking at ways to maybe change or adjust how they you know, give or, uh, to charities or to others. And, and right now might be a good time, definitely take advantage of that. The, the and they're Roth, need right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think yeah, the income levels have changed a lot. You have a good point. And the Roth conversions were maybe they didn't look as attractive before for for all ages. Um, definitely, I, I I've heard that from not just you know what we're doing in our firm, but also other advisors too. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing, um, and we don't try to forecast markets, as you know, we don't try to forecast elections, and you know, <laughs> the last election we learned you couldn't do that. Right. Data. So I'm, a, I'm not a political guy, but election coming up, presidential, congressional, all, all the above. There's talk because there's a little bit of an investment component here where, okay, we know there's been a lot of stimulus. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of quantitative easing right, over the years since 2008, the last 12 years it's been going on. So there's a lot of topic about or talk about this subject somebody's probably gonna, like you said, the deficit's only gotten bigger. Someone's gonna have to potentially pay for this, right? We have to pay for it somehow. And I think all parties agree that on that statement. Given the election, and you mentioned the TCJA Tax Act, sunsets in 2026. Is it possible, in your opinion, that, that with the election that we could see some tax laws change much sooner? Sooner? That's a good question. Uh... Yeah, I definitely think it's it's possible. It, it will depend on the Congress and, and right. if that flips, if, if everything goes to one party, uh, then certainly I think there there could certainly be changes uh, beforehand. Right. Um, but you know, those are really hard to pass. <laughs> right. Well, that, well, no, I agree, and I think it's 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 hard. And there's been talk about not just rates or brackets, but capital gains adjustments for different income levels. And again, it's going to be wait and see. But but I feel like you know, the government can issue a lot of bonds to pay for some of the stimulus, but there's been a little chatter already on the wait, you know, and, and have you back on in a few months and discuss what, what actually happens, mm -hmm. you know, the fall, but I know that's something to watch. So the taxes I think are gonna be a big component where people can be on the lookout. I know we're having a lot of discussions right now. You know, yeah. Kind of shifting gears a little bit. Um, and we talk a lot about planning as you do to your audience and some of the fundamentals to good planning. One of those I think that was probably reinforced more than ever uh, that I can recall was the importance of emergency reserves and having access to liquidity. Yes. So given that concept, and I, and I think for most people that you and I work with, we, we stress that and emphasize and we have a similar philosophy on that. But I know that still today, there's people that, regardless if it was a COVID or just an economic downturn, we'll call it, weren't ready. They weren't in a place. So talk to me a little bit about the importance of emergency reserves in your mind and some of the things you talk to your audience about. Yeah, so, you know, I personally like to have emergency reserves. I probably am a little more conservative than a lot of people uh, personally. And so when I'm working with advisors and their clients and trying to come up with what is the appropriate amount of emergency reserves to have on hand, 
you know, there is some pushback from both clients and advisors about, you know, I really, the market's going up right now. Why would I set aside that much cash in the savings account that's barely earning, you know, maybe 1%. Um, but what I like to emphasize is that money isn't meant for growth. That money is sort of a diversification so that if the market does go down, you have a place to go that's safe, um, that you don't have to sell in the downturn market. That's the worst time to sell, as we all know. Um, and so, so just making sure you have something. It, it doesn't actually have to be sitting in cash in the savings account, although I think there should be a certain amount that should be there. Um, you know, you could use debt uh, as another option. Some people say, oh, I have a credit card. You know, I keep around. I, I, I don't use it, but I could. And I think, well, you know, you might want to check that interest rate because right now they're running about 14%. <laughs> Um, and do you really want to pay 14% where you could have just had, you know, some money in the savings account and n never mind the peace of mind that comes along, uh, along with that. And two, you know, and it depends on, on the clientele you're working with. Um, I think a lot of younger clients, you know, they think, okay, well, if my income's down, I'll just, I'll get a side gig. I'll, I'll go out and I can drive for Uber if I have to, uh, it, or if I get furloughed or I can go work in a restaurant or things like that. Well, none of those options are available right now with, with the pandemic, everything shut down. And, and then what can you do? So if you, if you truly cannot earn an income, you cannot figure a way to get income, what are you going to do? And, um, and again, dipping into your investments is, is not, optimal but you know it's, it's available but it's not optimal and I, and I think you and I talked previously and a lot of folks are like okay well we've got we've got a good amount of bonds in our portfolio so that's where we would go if we had to and I, I think you said uh, uh, that day you were on the, the exchange bonds went down just as much as the stocks that day yeah yeah so, yeah no the, the reserves um, is a good point and that day back in March um, on the New York Stock Exchange, there was such a run on liquidity mm -hmm. that you saw not just corporate bonds falling, which even if that had good investment ratings, but you saw some treasuries and inflation protection because there was just a run on liquidity because everyone was trying to raise capital because the unknown, the uncertainty. When it's uncertainty is highest, that's a very common thing to see. It just happened to be very extreme that day. And you're right, having that emergency reserves. Um, is really important. And I think the, the interest rate comment you made is, is important too. We've heard that where some say, you know what, Mark, you know, I think having a couple of years of cash, maybe we can have only one year and invest the rest because, you know, we want to get a little more yield on our, on our uh, investment, our, our savings, and, and a year should be sufficient, right? And I think that's, and most people would feel good about that. Mm -hmm. But the argument, and I think it was a good lesson, right? Because the unknown about how long they may need to tap reserves. We may find out that some areas or some sectors and industries aren't going to return back to normal inside of 12 months. Right. Or, you know, it's going to be longer than that. So having the two years and then beyond that, having other layers of defense, I think on reserves is like, you know, it's debt or other investments. Maybe then it makes sense, but you're right. I think that's an important thing that if we learned one important fundamental or got reminded is that having good reserves is super important. Right. Um, so, so good perspective there. Kind of going into that comment you made about debt, that sometimes people use debt as reserves. We also know, like any even good companies, debt can be used in your favor, right? Mm -hmm. Both for companies or individuals and families. But talk to me a little bit about the idea of using debt for good and avoiding it when it's bad, right? right. And what people should think about. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of people, their goal is to be debt free, and 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 I absolutely understand that. It's it's emotionally, it's it's peace of mind, um, but I mean, debt right now is really inexpensive. Uh, mortgage rates. I think when I saw a book this morning, a thirty-year fix was three point one five percent, and a fifteen-year was maybe two point seven five percent. And for a mortgage, for for a uh, piece of real estate that is should be hopefully uh, appreciating that that's a great thing to invest in. Now, if you if you went and got a loan for I don't know a boat, a car, um, those are depreciating assets, right? So you don't really want to take on a lot of debt for those kinds of things. Um, but if you have access to low or cheap debt, 
that can go a long way, especially again, if you want to keep less emergency reserves, you could, as long as you have access to low interest rate debt, that, that's an option. So a home equity line, I think would be a fantastic trigger right now to, to have in place. Um, the funny thing about debt is, it's a lot easier to, to have access to those things when you actually have the money and you don't need it. So you really do want to plan ahead, make those relationships with those banks, um, get a home equity line in place, uh, if you have equity, um, and you know, with home equity lines, you, I'm sure you know, there is no interest that you pay until you actually draw from those funds. So it's just a line of credit that's there if you need it. Um, and, and it can, it can really help, uh, for short term cash flow situations mm -hmm. and can also help with the tax planning. So going back to the tax planning, let's say you need to, you need to buy a car, um, and all your money is sitting in a retirement account. Well, if you took out $50,000 from your retirement account, that's 100% taxable. That could push you into a higher tax bracket. It could force you to pay more Medicare premiums if you're on Medicare, depending on where you fall. So why wouldn't you then use your HELOC to buy it? And then you can take $25,000 out this year from your IRA and $25,000 in January and pay off the IRA. So there, there, it just gives you more flexibility. And, and I think having options and choices available are, are the keys to having like a strong financial plan personally. And that's a good point. I think the, the, the choices and the flexibility, we talk about flexibility a lot with our clients, you know, even if they don't need it, having choices, because it was very hard that like we talked about a minute ago with, you know, seeing bonds mm -hmm. and stocks, everything. I mean, it didn't matter how safe or good or bad. There was things that were going down in March because just liquidity, right? And the correlations I think I saw that I just ran them with somebody yesterday or the day before were the highest, meaning that everything was moving together. Mm -hmm. And they had been probably since 2008, I think it was. Um, wow. mm -hmm. And so the numbers, and, and that was high quality everything. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was a sign that having the flexibility because the risk of things being down. But I think a good example too was even when people were trying to get, you mentioned having good relationships, right? And, and access to capital in place in advance because when this happened, people were going out, let's say PPP loan, which was a whole different, whole different discussion in itself because people didn't understand the rules initially. But the point was in that they didn't, if you didn't have a relationship or you didn't have things in place, perhaps you couldn't get one. That's right. Initially. And so that was an example of people having to go out that channel or didn't have the home equity line because a lot of banks at that point were also being gun shy. Yep. And they, and they had to go out and maybe get these higher rate loans to third parties that were making them available for a fee and a hefty one at that. So that's a good example of doing things, even though you don't think you need them, just having the basic good debt yeah. place, perhaps and the bad debt not there. <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, you know, a lot, there's, there's been a huge move to online banking. I mean, I, I use an online banker, but there is definitely something to be said to have a local bank, just have an account there. Uh, I have my business account with a local bank here and they reached out to me when the PPP loan uh, became available. So, you know, I knew people that didn't have local banks and they were, they couldn't get through, they couldn't talk to anybody. So, um, yep. You want to think ahead and plan ahead and, and make, get those relationships in place if you can. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, you know, one thing in regarding related to banks and savings, um, accounts and, and having cash flow. sometimes we hear and our clients, I think know this drill, but we hear sometimes from, I think friends and family will ask me this question. Hey Mark, I got a little extra money. I'm looking for an opportunity. Where should I put it? You know what I mean? Not so much even the hot stock, maybe just should I buy some extra real estate and rent it out? Should I, you know, look for an alternative with private investment, extra cash? And I tell them sometimes, hey, you know what? You, you can if you have the risk tolerance, it fits in your plan or your situation. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe sometimes just having that extra savings or putting that to work for you for down the road also will compound. Talk to me about that philosophy a little bit. Yeah. Um you know, I, I think people put a lot of emphasis on their the return of their portfolio, and they think that that is the largest contributor to the success of their plan. If I can get, you know, 15% return year after year after year, which, you know, we all would love to do, <laughs> um, then, then it's going to be great. Or they might say, oh, I've, I've got a chance to, to invest in this one private company, um, and it's going to be a home run, and that, if that plays out, then, you know, I'm going to be a millionaire and everything's going to be lovely. But what really it comes down to, I mean, that, as you just said, that's super risky, right? I mean, you have no idea if that one in a million chance is going to happen. 
So I, I think it's more important to focus on just continuing to save. Just keep putting money away. The majority of your growth will come from your own dollars going in than it will from the earnings portion of that money. Um, uh, yeah, it's always funny. I, I had somebody come to me too, you know, during the downturn, like, I've got some cash. What would be a good, you know, industry right now? What's going to come back with the pandemic? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have no idea. I don't know anything about investments. Uh, you know, as a financial planner, I don't know anything about investments. I look at everything except the investments um, and, and ways to kind of offset that. I actually have my own financial advisor that manages my money. I don't manage my own money for that reason. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a really good point. I mean, I think having that, and part of it, I think, is it's not just you have to know everything about investing or planning, but just having that discipline or fundamental base mm -hmm. to doing the right thing and understanding how money can work for you when put in the right place over time. And you don't need necessarily the home run or the exotic investment. It doesn't mean that you can't go for that and speculate right. a little bit, but, but we, I'm with you is that sometimes just having that put to work and the same old boring thing you might already have. Mm -hmm. a piece of already mm -hmm. or a mutual fund or other strategy might be just as good versus spending it. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think as long as you're not relying on that, you, the success of your plan is not solely reliant on that one thing right. being a home run investment. It's sort of like relying on an, an inheritance <laughs> from your family and you're just kind of hoping they don't spend it all because that's actually a retirement plan. You think, yeah. Well, yeah, or the flip side of that, if somebody has, let's say, their emergency reserves in place, but they're holding maybe too much cash or too much savings and not putting that money to work for them in a vehicle. That's right. Right. So I think there's two sides of that. You have to balance. Mm -hmm. You have to balance sure. that out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one, one topic I think, and I know, you know, a lot of what we do, some would say, is not necessarily just financial planning or investing. And sometimes it's, it's risk management. You know, we're managing. Right we're managing risk in, in people's lives and helping them get compensated for taking the right kinds of risks and avoiding or protecting them in other ways and other risks that might exist, not just now, but in the future. When I think about risk, I was thinking about insurance. Mm -hmm. And not everyone likes to think about insurance. Now, obviously we have, we have to have auto insurance, you know, to drive. Mm -hmm. We have to have renters or homeowners insurance for where we live. But there's a lot of other insurance that I feel are, are very, very valuable in planning and sometimes even get a black eye because of bad experiences or the bad actors out there in the world that, that do that. Um, so talk to me a little bit about insurance and how you see it and recommend it and utilize it in your day to day for advisors and, and investors. Yeah. So, you know, the purpose of insurance is really to offset risk, some portion, it could be some portion or all of that risk. Right. So, um, so first, first thing to do is you want to identify what that risk is. Um, and so for example, you know, life insurance, that's an easy one. Everybody's familiar with life insurance. If I were to die, um, what would happen? What, what is it that I would want for my family if I were not around? Would I want the mortgage paid off? Would I want my kids' education funded? Would I want uh, my spouse to have to go back to work? And then if so, do we need to get childcare? So, so kind of looking through that. And so let's say, okay, you, you've figured out what your objectives are if, if the worst case scenario were to happen and I were to die tomorrow. Um, do I already have the resources to support those goals? And, you know, when you're younger, you, you usually don't. You don't have the resources to do all of that. Um, and that's where insurance comes in. And there's a lot of, you know, term insurance has gotten really inexpensive right now. I think um, probably a million dollar, 15 year term policy for a healthy 50 year old runs, I don't know, about $100 a month, $1,200 a year. So you can get it really cheap. Um, and, and then as you, as you age and you're continuing to save and, and you're paying down the mortgage and, and your kids are getting older, your needs reduce, right? And, and your resources go up. So, so that needs to be checked. Um, do I still need this million dollar life insurance policy? Maybe I only need half a million now. So you can think about laddering some of those things and so it sort of slowly drops off. Um, it's just an easy way to leverage your dollars to offset some of that risk. Um, disability is another example. I think, I think that's overlooked far too often. Um, for most people, 
their lifetime earnings is their biggest asset of, of their entire financial plan. And they need those dollars to fund all of these future goals, retirement, education, all of those things. So you need to protect that earned income. Um, but you should always check it. I mean, I'm not saying you, you buy some insurance and keep it forever until it runs out and that's fine. At some point, you can self-insure. And, and so that comes down to your own personal risk tolerance. Um, yes, I might be able to self-insure, but it's not that expensive. And if, if something were to happen, it'd be nice to have that extra cash come in. So, so each person's a little bit different. I would say the last one uh, that, that I see that's pretty important that gets ignored uh, goes under the property and casualty, like you were saying, the homeowners and auto. Um, everyone has homeowners and auto pretty much. What I don't see very often is the excess liability policies, so umbrella policies. And these are, these are policies that will pay out for liability claims that are above and beyond. So if you get in a car accident and your car insurance covers $500,000, but you get sued for $3 million, um, the, the umbrella policy will kick in the amount over the $500,000. And again, really inexpensive, one to $200 for a million dollar um, umbrella policy. And having that will allow you to reduce your underlying homeowners and auto policies to keep those premiums down. Um, and and it's, it's really worth it, especially if you've got kids that are driving <laughs> or about to start driving. You've got pets, you know, some dogs are considered dangerous. Um, you serve on, on board, you have a pool in your backyard and all the, the whole neighborhood likes to come and hang out at your house. I mean, you hear the horror stories and, and I don't, I don't want to fear monger and say, oh my gosh, you're going to get sued and, and, and make that a thing. But, but it's something to consider and it's, and it's pretty inexpensive uh, risk to cover. Yeah, yeah. The the, the umbrellas and excess liability. It's interesting because I'm with you. It's, it's not really a, a fear uh, discussion. It's more about just how much risk one do you want to have out there on the table with your assets that you've accumulated and potentially and earned. You know, and, and it also depends on some of the times your estate planning mm -hmm. you've done or put in place. I know it, just, it depends on what state you live in. There's different mm -hmm. levels of protection, and so I think that's a complicated one and good to discuss and make sure whatever someone has is in place but even just like you said in some ways it's just a good tool to use to bring down uh your auto insurance mm -hmm. uh, because especially if you're in colorado which i think is like the second or third or fourth most expensive in the country by balancing and coordinating coverages you you just it's a good financial decision to use that tool to, to make that you know adjust a little bit so i know there's different uses for it I think the disability and the life insurance topic, I'm with you. One thing I'll comment to add on to what you said, I think, is that we often see a couple common themes, um, and I'm curious what you see. With executives, you see sometimes, or, or uh, folks that have, are part of a larger company and they have employee, uh, employer coverage, they mm -hmm. just assume that's good to go and enough. Mm -hmm. But often, we know that people change jobs. Uh, we know sometimes people have an entrepreneurial bug in them mm -hmm. and to go do something in a business and later you buy insurance on average it gets more expensive so that's one thing i'm curious to get your thoughts on the second thing is around a business owner right you know you and i started businesses and there's risk to that and by having i feel like for our significant others and loved ones and families having these insurances in place kind of allow us to take more risk too yeah. should something happen not just investment risk but business risk right so maybe talk to me about what you see in regards to some of those decisions that people do and don't do. Yeah, no, I would agree. I mean, it is sort of like the emergency reserves too, right? If you, have, if you know you're okay for three years, you can take more risk with your portfolio because uh, if it goes down, it's okay. You still have your cash sitting aside. Um, yeah, I think if you serve on a board, if you're an executive on a board, you better check. I mean, you could be sued even on your HOA. Uh, mm -hmm. and so, so there's definitely some, some things to think through uh, of activities uh, that you do that you might not consider being risky at all. Um, uh, yeah, and, and again, as a business owner, you know, that's even more important because if you're gone, what's the value of your business worth? Um, it, it may be nothing <laughs> if you're not there. If you're the main person, the rainmaker running the show and, and you pass away and there's nobody there to sort of step in or you might be able to get pennies on the dollar um, to get somebody to take over, but so you really definitely want to look through that. If, if, if you're, again, if your financial plan is counting on, on something out of that business, then you need to protect it, right? Preserve, I mean, you, 
you've worked so hard to gather the assets you have right now. Why wouldn't you do what you can to preserve and protect it? It's almost, it's, it's as important as, you know, continuing to grow your assets. You want to yeah, and I think some of the assumptions uh, also have changed now that we're in a pandemic too, right? The liquidity mm -hmm. factor, going back to that, just a simple cash. And as a business owner or part of a large company, it may not be there in a pandemic as you had previously thought. So that's a good point. Um, yeah. So again, going back to the debt, access to debt as a business owner, it's really important to have good relationships and, and maybe have a credit line that you hardly ever use. But if you need it to pay payroll for the next three months to keep your people on, on staff and ready to come back to work when you're ready to, to open again, you know, that would be really important. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, you know, kind of a, one of the last big topics I'll, I'll ask you today is, and I know right now we're in a, you know, COVID-19 and a lot going on and a lot of different people are being impacted different ways. But in general, um, when it comes to planning, you know, spending often is the make or break, right? It doesn't matter perhaps how much someone has saved, how much someone has earned. When it comes to it and you have to, you're working still or in retirement, spending, I feel like, is a, is a make or break for a lot of people. Talk to me about your philosophy on spending and what people might be, should be thinking about um, you know, on their day-to-day -day or at least over time. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think the most successful financial plans I've seen are with clients who are flexible. Again, we're going back to flexibility and choices. So, so you've got your needs, you've got your wants, you've got your wishes. You kind of need to think through, yes, it would be terrible, but we can tighten our belts if we need to. And that's where, going back to the debt discussion, it's really nice to go into retirement debt-free. Um, there, there's a fixed expense that's gone. So um, if you have to cut back, you know, you're cutting back on more discretionary items versus the fixed items. Um, so, so let's say you do, you plan a huge family vacation every year and, and you know, you really want the, you want to pay for the whole family to come. You go get a, rent a house on the lake and, and get everybody to come every year. And it's, and it's the most memorable time and, and everybody looks forward to it. Well, you know, if the market tanks, I mean, really tanks, you, what you don't want to do is, is take away memories, right? You don't want to panic and not spend for memories. But, but maybe, you know, it, well, and now nobody's traveling. <laughs> anyway, so I don't know about vacation, you know, the big European vacations. But you, but you could adjust it. So let's say it's usually a European vacation. So now instead you, you rent a house at a lake and get everybody that can drive to come there. Or, or maybe you postpone it a year. You know, maybe things are just so uncertain that, you think, okay, if we just delay one year, that would be helpful. Same with the car purchases. You know, you like to replace your car every five years or every three years when the lease is up. You know, maybe just consider postponing it. it, it it's not a do or die. It just gives the market a little bit more time to recover before you have to withdraw in a down market um, to fund those needs. And so having flexibility, again, provides more choices, allows more time for recovery. Um, it, it really... Th those, that is probably the biggest contributor to success that I've seen in my experience. That's good. Um, one, you know, the, the spending's hard and I, we sometimes break it down even like just essential and discretionary, mm -hmm. right? Because I think your flexibility point is, is right on. And the essentials we know we have to have, can't live without. Discretionary, while some of those may feel like essentials, we know yeah. <laughs> back of our minds if we had to have the adjustment made, mm -hmm. we can. So I think that's a good point. You know, one last question, I, you know, as far as, you know, we, we're both part of NAFA, and I know you, you oversee a, a group here in Denver, um, and it really drives fiduciary and fee only and want to do the best thing for investors at all times. It sounds pretty common sense, but unfortunately, there are some bad actors out there that don't always do that for, for the folks right. clients. But given that everything, you know, where you try to help as many people as possible, especially right now, you know, what are some of the things, um, you know, investors and advisors alike can be doing right now during this pandemic from a planning standpoint and really taking advantage of, you know, to put them in a better place, maybe not immediately, but in the future as we go forward. That's a good question. You know, and I think, I think kind of the same things we were just talking about, like look at your tax planning opportunities right now, do the things that, that you can do Mm -hmm. and try not to worry about the things you can't control, right? 
it's probably is that an AA thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's everywhere right now. Like, yeah, right. yeah. And so try to focus your energy on the things that 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 you can do that will keep pushing your plan moving in the right direction as best as possible. And that and that's not sadly that's not available to everyone. I mean, there are some folks without a job or without an income and potentially without housing, you know, it wants the, the mortgage relief and the rent relief uh, goes away. So trying to, to plan ahead as best you can, plan for downturns, you know, work with a solid advisor to work on your investment strategy, but also do these other things on the side to, to protect the downside. So the investment strategy is more for the upside and, and all these, the tax planning, the insurance, all these things are sort of to protect and preserve on the downside. Um, and just and just reviewing things and, and being clear about where you want to go um, and just taking taking steps. It's, it's just the consistency and habits that you set up um, that I think will will make you more successful. That's great. That's fantastic. Um, Sue Chesney, Delegated Planning, thanks so much yeah. for your time today. Uh, I think our audience is going to love this and we'll have you back again soon and kind of see how yeah. some different things change the election and other laws in the next year. So thanks everybody yeah. for joining. And we'll talk to you all soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you.